approximately 5.15 p.m. Uh, the first presentation is going to be my, by Councilman Roth. Councilman Roth. Thank you, Mayor. I always feel it's important to recognize people for the good deeds they do. I'm a good deed doer. There's a lot of people out here that are good deed doers. And um, during this season, when companies and organizations are out donating goods and toys and food, turkeys for, for families that are in need, this organization does it year-round. Uh, First United Methodist Church at Homestead and their food pantry service our community year-round. And I want to bring up Pastor Brock Schiffer, who's going to tell you a little bit more about what they do and what their mission is. When somebody who is not a member of that church has their praises to sing, that speaks volumes for that church. I'm going to go back about 12 years ago when we, when we still had our own church before going into full-time ministry in another area. And on Saturday mornings, for about four years, every other Saturday, we would give away free clothing at 7 o'clock in the morning. People would actually start arriving at 6 o'clock to get in line, and they would come and get a bag of clothes, and we did that for a long time. One particular Saturday morning, I'll never forget, a young man walked down the street from the Methodist Church, introduced himself, and said, how do you do what you do, and, you know, what's your time frame? And I told him, I said, by the way, why would you ask? He said, because we're thinking about putting in a food pantry. This was 10 years ago. These incredible people, and I use the word advisedly, incredible people, for 10 years, every single Saturday, and I believe you've missed maybe two or three in the 10 years, it is extraordinary. They're now feeding 500 families, not individuals, 500 families every single Saturday, rain, sleet, or snow, if it had to happen. It's been amazing. I've had the privilege of sharing uh, with some of our, the church where we attend. We come a few times each year to fill in. Uh, I'm sure they would like me to say they can always use more people on Saturday morning about 8 o'clock. And trust me, when you show up, have sneakers on because you're going to work. You're going to work from the time you get there till 12 o'clock when they shut down and there's still people waiting in line. And so they are what I like to call one of the hidden angels in Homestead. I have the privilege from time to time of writing an article uh, for the paper about some of the angels that are in our community. And I've, it's my privilege to speak on your behalf tonight. I, God is proud of you. We are proud of you. I can't thank you enough. I know that I believe there's a, a plaque coming in the very near future, but for the, for the time being, we just wanted to thank you for all that you do for this community. God bless you. I'm proud to be your friend. Thank you. And with that, let's bring up the, uh, the members of the church. All of you. Don't be shy. It's okay. It doesn't matter. We're, we're all here together. We're going to make this presentation to the pastor. Sir? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And if you want to take a second, before we do this, let's take a second and introduce the people you brought with you. Yeah, I'm Ben Stowell Hernandez, the pastor of the church. I've been here since July and I've been really impressed and thankful for the work that we've done here over the last 10 years. Yes, uh, 10 years ago when we started this, uh, we really didn't know what we were doing and uh, it's incredible what it has become. Uh, we started with maybe six or eight volunteers and now we have a like between 30 and 40 on a Saturday feeding uh, 500 families. Thank you. All right, with this, I wanted to take an opportunity to present this certificate of recognition. It should really be more of a certificate of appreciation for what you guys do for our community on a weekly basis. Taking care of 500 families is a tremendous undertaking, and I know I appreciate it, and I'm sure those pe people appreciate it much more than I do. So thank you very much for your service to our community and continuing to help make Homestead the best community it can be. Thank you guys very much.
We just put out an APB on the vice mayor, but I just, <laughs> just showed up, so. you whenever you're ready. Yeah, my sheet. Uh, I don't know. I have the honor of introducing the Artists in the Spotlight for the month of October and November. This, uh, this is the second month. You already have shown your exhibit or your work at the Seminole Theater for the month of October. And so I'd like to invite uh, Mimi Dixon up to talk about her artwork and her exhibit uh, and what you can do if you want to go see the artwork and what inspired you to create it. And so I'll turn the, the floor over to you. stand on the side or whatever you want. I just want to thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to show my work. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm a graduate of the Mass now called the Massachusetts College of School and Arts College of School and Design. At the time I graduated, it was the Massachusetts College of Art. And uh, I have to say, it was the only art school in Massachusetts that did go for uh, college work at that time. And uh, it's something we have to encourage with the children nowadays because it is so important. Uh, because of you, Steve Shelley, I try to put a lot of orchids in the show because that's something you, you really go for. And in fact, uh, I was inspired by one of your ghost pictures and uh, there is a small picture oh. up there. Okay. Um, I didn't bring any uh, pictures today of orchids or anything like that, but I brought pictures that I have done, the uh, prints that uh, represent uh, South Florida. Over there are the poinsettias, and uh, that's something I've made into a Christmas card. This particular one is Homestead Harvest. It's just a print. The original was quite large. I'd like to show that. And I was also invited to do, uh, if you recall, in I believe it was 71, the uh, flamingos in Coral Gables, and Youth Fair commissioned me to do the flamingo. And uh, this was the flamingo that I did. I just think it's very important to be able to do art and uh, I try to volunteer some of my time over at the hospital now to encourage some of the older people, excuse the expression, because <laughs> I'm one of them, <laughs> to uh, just be occupied with something like that. And I do want to thank you for your, the opportunity. Thank you. 
Well, thank you. And are you going to have a gallery night, or have you already had a gallery night? Uh, you did have one last yes, last month. Okay. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure if you were having another one that we made sure to announce the time for everybody. <laughs> Next time. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Um, Vice Mayor, thank you, sir. Um, this is going to conclude our special presentation, so uh, we'll reconvene at 6 o'clock for our regular council meeting. Thank you, everyone. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call the Tuesday, November 28, 2017, council meeting to order. It's approximately 6.01 p.m. This evening, the invocation will be by uh, Father James McCraner from the Sacred Heart Catholic Church followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, would you please rise? Good and gracious God, shine your light into our hearts and minds this evening. Give us wisdom and understanding in how to use our talents effectively so that we may fulfill our calling as commissioners and citizens of this city. With joy and satisfaction, allow us to be helpers of our community, extending kindness, love, and humility in the decisions we make, so as to lift up and improve the lives of those we represent for the betterment of all people in our city. Lord, we ask you to release in each one of us your creative spirit we ask for open minds and open hearts that we might explore smart and imaginative solutions to the complex problems of our city. We ask for your wisdom and for the perseverance necessary to identify, develop, and apply significant life-changing ideas to persistent challenges. We give thanks for the many blessings we have already received. We ask you to continue our blessings upon us and all those we love, wherever they are at this time. And we make these prayers as we make all our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Could you please join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, Father McCraner, for the prayer. <coughs> we'll call Madam Clerk. Councilman Roth. Here. Councilwoman Bailey. Here. Councilwoman Faircloth. Here. Councilman Burgess. Here. Vice Mayor Shelley. Here. Mayor Porter. Here. Any additions, deletions, deferrals? Mr. Manager. Um, I'd like to request uh, from council if I could move item 24 up to immediately behind the consent agenda. Uh, one of the uh, participants that's with us is going to have to catch a flight. So is there any objection to moving 24 up? Okay. Tab one is a presentation by the Chamber of Commerce, South Dade Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Mr. Gold. Good evening, um, Mr. Mayor and Council. I'd like to ask my board members to join me up here if they would. <clears throat> um, our purpose today is to first thank you for... Um, let's... Um, can you just announce, because what we, have, we have a problem with the well filling up, and, and okay. it's, it's a little... So if you don't mind just sitting down, and, and Corey, if you'll do the presentation, sure, maybe sure. have them stand as, they, okay. as, they, as you can announce them. Okay, sure, be happy to do that. But I do want to first start off by saying thank you so much for all the support we've received from the council, um, from Mr. Porter, Mayor Porter, and all of the council members, as well as George Gretzis, our city manager. Um, our purpose here today is just to introduce the board of directors of the South Dade Chamber of Commerce. Our goal this year is to work very closely with you to make um, 
Homestead better than ever, and of course it's always been great, but we really do want to improve the camaraderie between the Chamber of Commerce and city government, and that's our main goal for um, working with you. Um, but let me introduce our board members. I'm going to start off with our executive director, our new CEO, Kerry Black. Kerry. <clears throat> um, George Maracas is our chair-elect. Uh, Sharon Wilson, I know Sharon's here somewhere, is our immediate past chair. I didn't see Bill Duquette. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Bill Duquette is our uh, operations chair. Joe Webb, I saw Joe. Joe is our secretary and treasurer. He handles all our money. Sharon Gold is our government affairs uh, liaison. Uh, I'm not sure if Maggie Anzardo was able to make it tonight. No? Okay. Olga Eby, um, who is working with our Hispanic committee. Sip Garza with the Mexican-American Council. Um, Charlie Hudson, who's working with PR, public relations. Charles Knight with education. Mickey McGuire, I'm not sure if Mickey was able to, oh, there he is, good. Quality of life, everybody knows Mickey. Uh, Natun Patel, I don't think he made it, he's with business development. Dallas Pierce um, is heading up our young professionals group. Peter Schnebley was with agriculture. Susanna Vela, I know she's here, um, for education. David Wirth, who was uh, originally our CORD leader and is now with Business Development and the Economic Development Council. Susan Newman and Roxanne Jagers are both doing uh, philanthropy. Abe Hewitts, who is away with the Air Force right now, is Business Development. Claude Condo is Business Development. Georgia Brew is Agriculture in the Farm Bureau. Brian Canessa, Fativa and, and Tourism. Kurt Cadle for the Military Affairs Committee, and Yvonne Knowles with Main Street. And again, we want to say thank you for all the support you've given us so far, and we hope to work very closely with each of you. And if there's anything that we can do to support you, help you, we are here. And thank you. Thank you, Corey. I want to say that, you know, the, 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 one of the things we always have to, uh, to find a way to listen to the business community, and that's what I think the Chamber really do, does need to do is give us more and more feedback from the business community and you are the eyes and ears to the business community so thank you for coming and letting us uh, uh, meet your new directors or your your board members thank you. thank you sir moving on to tab two the consent agenda is there a motion moved and seconded all in favor Aye. motion carries if we could go to tab 24 please You have to read something. Else. Oh, you want to do it? Okay. Mr. Manager? Sure. Mayor, this is uh, very good news. This is the first of many items that you're going to see before you related to uh, potential funding streams for our Cyberry project. Uh, we discussed with you way back when that uh, there was a, a federal program called New Market Tax Credits that's to, that has been created by the federal government to try to encourage banks and other entities to invest in uh, certain areas in the country uh, as an economic development initiative. And so, as you know, because many of you have been helping us in, in, in talking to the banks and the organizations, we have our first commitment letter here from, uh, it's uh, Banco Popular, I guess the technical, uh, their official name is uh, uh, Popular Community Capital LLC. And basically what they've done is they have uh, and before you is a, a, a reservation letter in essence, which uh, would bring about $1.4 million of funding into our Cyberry project. Now, as you know, we have a, a bunch of different uh, uh, funding uh, opportunities, and we've talked about kind of three piles. And the first pile really is funds that are part of the, the city's control sort of uh, CDBG funding would be a good example of that. So that would be the first pile. The second pile of funding would be in new market tax credits. And what we've hoped for is, or we've kind of projected out a goal of $4 million uh, of new market tax credits, although we're shooting for a six and we're hoping for the best between Cyberry and, and the, the overall project. And then third is we're hoping for an outside investor so that as we, at some point within the next few months, bring to you a contract for construction, at that point we're going to have a better sense of 
how well our runners, we have a runner in every lane of these funding opportunities, and each of them are running at their own speed, and we're not gonna come to you and ask you to commit any final funds of the city until we know that each runner has made it or has dropped off. And at that point, we'll add up all these funding sources and see what we have, and then we'll tailor the project according to that. So we have really, we have plans for a small, medium, and large, the large being uh, what we're hoping for and we think we have a reasonable shot at. Uh, when we started this, we weren't really sure how lucky we'd get with new market tax credits and uh, the organizations that make selections. They have for about every $10 uh, in funding requests, they have about $1 in, in funding. And so it's a very highly competitive system. And so we pitched Cyberry and Homestead Station because we felt they were really uh, great projects for economic development, particularly in a community that has been financially distressed. And so because of the quality of these projects and the excitement that they brought, we really have become uh, in, on the short list of many of these organizations that are deciding on their projects. Banco Popular is the first one, and the reason why it's before you today is what they want to hear from you as, a, as, a, as an elected body is, yes, we're interested in this type of funding, and we want to basically move the ball forward, because if you say yes tonight, what will end up happening is there's a whole lot of, it's sort of like, um, well, let's say if, if you have, uh, it's a commitment letter, but you have a whole lot of documents that you still have to prepare, and we also have a lot more work to do in terms of the actual construction costs, the operational agreements, but also the reason why we asked you to move this thing forward is between the consultants and the lawyers, everybody that it takes, this is a very complicated program. But the most important things you need to know tonight is that in essence what you're doing tonight is you're saying to the, the Banco Popular, yes, we're interested in, in reserving this and uh, moving forward with the process. You'll also be creating a structure because new market tax credits don't go directly to governments. You have to create a nonprofit that all the investment flows through. And so you'd be creating that as well. What you'll also, if we're lucky, and you never know with these things, one day we think we're losing and one day we think we're winning, but if we have other banks that say they want to commit and we have a tentative commitment with another group for which will we think will bring an additional $1.5 million. We'll keep bringing these letters to you as we get the commitments so that we can get a manifestation of support from this board so that letter by letter, hopefully we fill up our basket. And so that's kind of what this is. It doesn't commit you to the Cyberry project. All it does is say to Banco Popular that, uh, that you wanna move forward. There's a $20,000 deposit that it commits you to. So they just wanna make sure that you have at least some skin in the game. And so that's what that does. And it also creates this nonprofit, which it's the preliminary stages of that because you'll still have to come back and create bylaws and a system. So you'll have that as well. We also have started the procurement process on the construction of the building, the interior fit, fit outs, and to look for a management uh, operator. And so that just hit the street last week. That'll take uh, uh, you know, a couple of months before uh, responses come in, before there's a vetting process, and before staff comes to you with a recommendation. By then also, hopefully, we'll have some of our other piles and some of our runners will make it to the finish line. And uh, we'll update you as things progress, but this is probably the first of many items that you're gonna see on this. And like the, the drop dead commitment date for you all will be, or day, the event is going to be when you decide you have enough information to award a contract to a construction company and for an operator and interior fit outs. And of course, we won't recommend that day come until we know that all the funding sources are secured and we know exactly how much money we have. But we're doing really well with this. And I thank you all for your leadership because it has mattered very much to the groups. They've come here, they've seen the other projects that we've completed on time and on budget. They see the commitment uh, from this council. And, uh, and so, so far, so good. This is a very good sign. Typically, when you get the first one, it gives the other entities encouragement to also start to invest. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to, well, Matt, do you want to read the resolution first and then we'll take questions? 
It's a resolution of the city of Homestead, Florida, approving the formation of Cyberry Inc., a Florida corporation not for profit, to serve as a qualified low income community business in a new market tax credit transaction to provide financing for the Homestead Cyberry project, approving the execution of a reservation letter with Popular Community Capital LLC, authorizing the execution of documents providing for an effective date. Any questions from council? <clears throat> Ms. Fairclough? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Just for clarity purposes, based on what you just presented as well as what is included in our um, documents, we are in the preliminary phase of the new markets tax credit process. And as a part of that preliminary phase, it calls for us to authorize the formation of the nonprofit as well as accept the non-binding, which is very important, non-binding reservation for up to $8 million in new markets tax credits. So at this point, the city is only responsible for putting down the $20,000 deposit, at which point will the city receive that money back? Because it's important for the community to know that we're not putting millions of dollars out there, but we're trying to procure millions of dollars to support the Cyberry project. So at what point does that $20,000 come back? Hold on, Jim. Go ahead, sir. If the new market transaction closes as planned, that $20,000 would be refunded to the city at that time in full. If the city pulls out of the transaction at any point between now and closing, um, then it's a legal deposit. So whatever Banco Popular has already incurred for legal expenses, they would retain. So if they've spent $5,000, they would keep five and return 15. If they've spent the full 20, they would keep the full 20. So it is a refundable deposit, but if we're the ones that pull out and walk away, they get to keep their legal costs um, because they're committing to us. So they wanna make sure that they don't do all the, their lawyers don't do all this paperwork. And then we say, you know, we don't wanna participate in this. And then they're out the time and effort. So the city is not <clears throat> placing itself in risk of, of losing any funding or paying out an exorbitant amount of funding if this agenda item is approved tonight for the formation of the nonprofit and to accept the, the non-binding reservation for the new markets tax credits. That is correct. It's the $20,000 refundable deposit, um, the legal deposit for Banco Popular, and that is all at this point. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ma any other questions from council? Okay, uh, this is a public hearing. Uh, I will open up the comments from the public. Anyone would like to speak for or against uh, moving forward on this, you're welcome to speak. We'll set the clock at three minutes and just give me your name and address for the record, please. Hello, how are you doing? Javier, 33031. So you guys are, um, I'm sorry? Full address? It's 33031. I don't have anyone else's address here. What is your, what is your last name, sir? McDonald. M McDonough? M-A-C, yeah. Okay. All right, sir. It's easy to find. It's a Google search. No big deal. Go ahead, sir. So you're saying at uh, tab 24, I believe, you're just talking about? Um, the city of Homestead wants a return of poor people's money? You're going to lend out poor people money, and then you want a full return for poor people's money. That's what I understood. That's all I want to say right now. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, sir. Edward Powell, 745 Southeast 18 Lane. Mayor, council, new mayor, Mr. Daly, Bailey, uh, welcome to the council. As you all know, you've been received and have received many, many emails from me many of which have not been answered, many of which have been ignored. Uh, Mr. Gretzis, you did answer faithfully till about two months ago, and not that stopped. I have gotten a few documents from the city clerk, half of what I've asked for publicly, and in this whole process, I have a accounting here. It's, it's Carlos Perez from George Gretzis, Monday, March the 3rd, and it lists resources. 3.865 million section 108 loan. I don't know what a 108 loan is. Does anybody else know what a 108 
section loan is, I don't know what that is, 1.8 million CDBG, I don't know what that is, Bowling Alley, we know what that is, I don't know if that was 2.3, but it's here, uh, CRA, a million, how about the uh, sale of the library property, 2.3, what about the building, Mr. Roth, that we're going to have to pay for if we opt out from the county? You are a commercial realtor, and you probably know what the value is. It's on the books at $2.3 million. It's not in here as a cost. So when you get done, here's new tax market, uh, new market tax credits of $4 million, which you discussed. I don't know what that is. Does that mean we pay it back if it, if it falls flat? How much of this $16 million are we indebted for? And is the $16 million actually going to be the cost of the construction? Now, I heard that the construction documents are complete. And typically, when you do construction documents, you do an estimate of cost. So there probably should be somewhere a construction cost for the documents that I guess now are complete. It would be nice if we would know what those are. It would be nice if you would tell us what's going on between the city and the county. Because to date, there has been very little conversation. Sure. Correct. I talked to them. I've got documents here from the county that I can't get from you. Okay, I've got the contract between the county and the city for the library. I can't get that from the city. I, you know where I have to get it from? I have to get it from the county. Thank you very much. Please spend our money wisely. Thank you very much. Anyone else at this time? I'll close the public hearing. Eric, would you like me to respond? Or? Yes, sir, Mr. Manager. Sure. A couple of things. Like I mentioned before, there's a variety of funding sources. What uh, I think we all discussed, and this has been a, a very evolutionary process, the, the concept here was to try to build the best uh, state-of-the-art library that we could build with whatever resources we can find. And so that's a mouthful because there's a whole lot of funding sources out there that you have to chase, each of them with their own timelines and each of them with their own requirements and criteria. And so what we tried to do is look at funding sources that would not impact the general fund or go to the voters for a bond referendum and ask them to raise their taxes to build a library. So in essence, I hate to use the word free money because in some cases they're federal uh, funding sources. I call it free money even though each of us have paid into that money. The thing is we can sit on our hands here in Homestead and let other communities take that money or we can chase it and get it for ourselves and build a library. The reason why you see things like Section 108 loan and Community Development Block Grants or CDBG is these are programs that uh, have been established, long-term programs from the federal government that are specifically designed to fund programs that will benefit lower income people. So the great thing about a, a library project is everyone benefits and because we have a significant uh, percentage of our population that's lower income, these programs we end up qualifying for, and this project qualifies for, and so we can spend that money on this, or we can spend it on something else, and in some cases, we can find other federal programs that meet that same criteria and get it for ourselves, or let somebody else get it and build something or do something with it in another community that's very far away from us. So the question about why the, the uh, Section 108, quote, loan, it, that is a program by the federal government community development block grant where the city is entitled to an allotment each year based on our population and our demographics, and we get that allotment. What the federal government allows you to do for bigger projects is it allows you to calculate what those allotments are per year and then borrow off that money that you pay back with the federal government's money. And so when you see that, that 3.8 million or whatever the dollar amount he cited, that is a loan technically, but it's paid for with federal grant monies. And so each of those, the CRA funding, for example, that's funding that's designed specifically for uh, economic development in a distressed area, which our community redevelopment area is. 
And then, so the, the one pot of money which I had referred to as those within our control, they're within our control, however, they are um, specifically aimed for a thing that would meet the criteria of the program. There was one other piece where it, there was the sale of the uh, bowling alley property, or the library property, I wasn't sure which, which one he men mentioned, but the concept with the library property was uh, a library for a library, an asset for an asset. And so whether it's the bowling alley property or the library property, we've always had that, that philosophy of if you're going to take an asset and sell it, it should be swapped for another asset so that it, you're not, your books it remains the same. And, but the question becomes, is, is a vacant property or fallow land better to have or is it better to have an asset that's actually creating both a tremendous benefit uh, educationally for a community, the access to resources for a facility like this in Homestead is very important for the people who live here, but it also is going to be an important economic development benefit as well because we be, believe what we're designing is something that will attract many more people outside the region and create more people in the downtown, hopefully more people that will spend money at the shops and, and create a nightlife and a downtown life because this is a facility we're taking, in essence, swapping a 40-year-old facility that hasn't seen a whole lot of love and attention uh, and turning it into something that is very unique, probably uh, the, uh, a state-of-the-art library that no one has seen before, and we think it's going to generate a lot of activity. The second pot of money is new market tax credits. I think the question was, do you have to pay that back? New market tax credit funding is very similar to a lot of other grants that we accept and that we use for city programs. As long as you follow the rules and use that money for the things that you're allowed to use it for, you don't have to pay the money back. So that would be a great example of that would be community development block grants. They have rules about how you spend the money. That's why we audit the spending. We have a finance department that makes sure, and we have a, con a CDBG consultant that makes sure that whatever we spend fits within the criteria so that HUD doesn't come back and tell you, oh, you got to pay the money back. FEMA is another example, which cities all over the country face. They reimburse you for hurricane expenses, which you'll see on your agenda tonight. But at the time you're spending on hurricane expenses, you have to follow all their rules and document everything so that when they reimburse you, you don't have to pay it back long term because they tell you later that you violated the rule. So that is the second big pile of money here, hopefully, would be new market tax credits. And that is something that as long as, and I'll give you an example of if, if you don't follow the rules. If you end up, another council, let's say four years from now, decides we're going to close the library down and open up a, a casino. Believe it or not, casino is one of those that they specifically say, if you use that money to open up a casino, you've got to pay the money back. So when the final documents are before you, you're going to see a list of everything that would trigger what they call a recapture event, and they call them the sin businesses, and I'm not passing judgment, but that's massage parlors, and there's certain things in there that they've specified would not be allowed if you choose to shut the library down and do something else. But it's, it's a, just a handful of things, uh, and you'll see those before. And I think when you see the list, I don't think any of you are going to have any issues with worrying about recapture or having a future council uh, shut down a library to put in a casino. Uh, that would be the second one. The third one is what we're hoping for is whatever operator we select for this that will bring in some outside investment as well, private investment, so that we can have the biggest, best version of this facility that we can have because the 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 designer of this facility has always envisioned, and the only reason that they agreed to partner with us is they envisioned us using this as a prototype and then bringing in investors and then opening up facilities all over the country where we would share in some of that revenue stream. So with that would come some sort of an investment from an outside investor, and that obviously is process is still unfolding. What we wanted to do is prepare for the best case scenario and understanding that when all our runners are at the finish line, we'll be able to count up how much each of them have brought in. So what we've designed for is 
the, the large version, small, medium, and large, and that version anticipates total investment between outside investment and uh, uh, federal sources and other sources, $31 million construction. If the outside investor doesn't come in, obviously that's the first ratchet down, and we'll know within the next two, three months how much we have to spend. We also need to make the point that, like Mr. Powell said, you can estimate these things, but until you go to the market and you actually see what these are gonna cost, the actual cost, you don't know. So before we come to you with any final numbers, obviously we wanna see what the market, what the proposers actually propose. And so we'll have those numbers for you as well. So I really can't give you a final number on what this will cost until people, uh, you know, real companies bid for the work. And so that was it as far as the question of the county library system. What we've been having the discussions with and what we envision is, because we think it's good for everybody, is since the city would own this facility, would control this facility, would operate this facility, we think the more people that go, the better it is for the facility and for the downtown. And we think one great option would be for members of the Miami-Dade County Library System to be able to utilize the facility and there be reciprocity. So we've been having discussions with the county about that. There is a li library tax. The county already taxes to operate the library. And so what we're trying to do is to negotiate an agreement that it will allow for that. And also, there is a provision in the current contract with the library that, uh, that speaks to the question of if that facility, if the facility uh, that currently exists is shut down, what obligations would the city have? And the city's position is that that building doesn't have a whole lot of value, and we're asking for them to do is to calculate the value of that building based on our formula of, of how to calculate the value because we believe as you look at that property, the highest best use is not to have a building there because the county is not allowed to use that, li that land unless, because it's city land, they're not allowed to use that building unless there's an open library there. And so if they shut that library down because there's a much newer one down the street, then how much value does that have versus if you sell that property off in combination with the other city hall site and have a much larger commercial site. It's very unlikely that anybody's gonna keep that building. It's likely a teardown, as would the city hall building be a teardown as well. So I think I've addressed most of those questions. Again, I, I certainly would expect and I encourage people who have questions, this is an evolutionary process. More information comes in each week and we'll continue to answer the questions as best as we can. There's certain things I can't, you know, we don't yet have an agreement with the county, and as soon as we have something, then I'll have more information, but I can, if, if, if every week I get another question about that, there's not much I can do other than to say we're still negotiating, and that's pretty much what we're doing. Any questions for the manager? I, I'm very comfortable, I was briefed, and I'm very comfortable with the process, where you are, and, and how you're approaching this, and. And it's as you said, you know, if, if we don't go out and, and seek these funds, they will go somewhere else. They will go somewhere else. So, um, is there a motion? Is there a second? Roll call, Madam Clerk. Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilman Roth? Yes. Councilwoman Faircloth? Yes. Vice Mayor Shelley? Mayor Porter? Yes. The motion carries. Go back to the regular agenda. I think we're all going to go to tab 11. Did they do a consent? Public hearings. Mr. Attorney? Yes, this uh, is the quasi-judicial section of your agenda. Please be advised the following items on the agenda are quasi-judicial in nature. If you wish to comment upon any of these items, please indicate the item number you would like to address when the announcement regarding the quasi-judicial item is made. An opportunity for persons to speak on each item will be made available after the applicant and staff have made their presentations on each item. 
Swearing in, all testimony, including public testimony and evidence, will be made under oath or affirmation. Additionally, each person who gives testimony may be subject to cross-examination. If you do not wish to be either cross-examined or sworn, your testimony will be given its due weight. The general public will not be permitted to cross-examine witnesses, but the public may request the council to ask questions of staff or witnesses on their behalf. The full agenda packet on each item is hereby entered into the record. Persons representing organizations must present evidence of their authority to speak for that organization. Further details of the quasi-judicial procedures may be obtained from the clerk. In accordance with Code Section 2-591, any lobbyist must register before addressing the council on any of the following items. At this time, council members must disclose any ex parte communications concerning any items on the agenda. Vice Mayor. I've had uh, discussions on tab 15 and 16 with the um, representative of the applicant as well as neighbors uh, in the community that we affected by the that items. Uh, Mr. White, I, I have to recuse myself on items 15 and 16. Is this the appropriate time? When we get there. Okay. Noted when we get there. Okay, let me know. Right. Anything else, sir? <clears throat> Mr. White? Nothing else. If I hear nothing. No other uh, ex parte communications at this time. Uh, the clerk will swear in any persons who wish to testify on any of the following items. So if anyone in the audience wishes to speak on the quasi-judicial agenda items, uh, please uh, stand to raise your right hand and be sworn by the clerk. Please state your name. Hereby swear or affirm that the information I present shall be the truth and nothing but the truth will help me God. Thank you, you may be seated. First item for consideration this evening is tab 11. It's a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida granting site plan approval for a mixed use multimodal transportation facility, including a cyber component totaling approximately 149,213 square feet and a parking structure providing for 1,429 parking spaces on a 4.7 acre parcel located at 4 South Chrome Avenue and 100 South Chrome Avenue, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Is there a report from staff? Was yes, sir. Uh, the staff has reviewed this application, and we recommend that the mayor and council approve this site plan request. Uh, this is, as you know, a city revitaliz revitalization initiated to, to stimulate economic development, create a sense of place and community within the downtown. It's been submitted, the site plan's been submitted in conformance with the development agreement for the site and envisions that the, the development is multifaceted, including a private development component consisting of an entertainment facility with 10 cinema screens, 14 bowling lanes, a video arcade, food service areas, about 67, in about a 67,000 square foot building um, in a public development component that consists of uh, five retail liner buildings totaling about 31,000 square feet. Um, up to a nine level uh, 1400 space parking garage and a 51,000 square foot uh, three story cyberry. Uh, we've checked it out uh, relative to the site plan standards in our zoning code and our comprehensive plan and we recommend approval. Here, this, the one point I wanted to make is this site plan anticipates up to 1,429 spaces. What the city paid for with the, develop, the developer was a minimum of 1,000 spaces. Anything in excess would be their cost. Right now, they're targeting about 1,200. The site plan goes to the maximum just in case there's, there's more. But right now, minimally, you're getting about 200 free spaces out of the deal. So already, you're getting a, a good deal for your money. Thank you, sir. Questions from council? Vice Mayor. Uh, question, uh, this is, I mean, obviously a cornerstone project. Uh, we've talked about it for, you know, a year or more now, two years or more. This process is in moving forward. I mean, it's a great economic impact, or should hopefully have a great economic impact for our downtown, you know, with all the projects that are going on with that. Do we happen to know a, an approximate, assuming this passes tonight, approximate time frame of construction or breaking ground and, and when this product might actually pop out of the ground? Yes, although we're much more comfortable giving uh, completion dates when we have control over the project. Right. We have an outside developer that's right. it's a public-private partnership, so we'll give a tentative date. To Gemma, you want to go on the record with a tentative date? You want to let them know what the tentative uh, construction start date is first? Yes, the tentative construction start date is January, and the tentative completion date is 
the first quarter of 2019. Um, we're hoping for February, but at the outset, it would be the end so of Around Q1. 16, 18 months. Ricky from Axiom is here. Did you want to wave your hand and... You want to wave how many months in your hand, or how, what do you, what do you, what you want to, 14 to 16 months is what he's saying. You're welcome to come up and say, but 14 to 16 is what he said? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Great. Thank you. I, I just think it was, I won't hold you to those timelines exactly. I'll leave it as an estimate at this point. But I think it's critical because we've talked about this for so long. I think it's important for the community to realize this is actually going to happen, assuming we, we pass this tonight, you know, that these plans will occur, that this great project will hopefully do everything that we hoped it will do for our downtown and that way can people get excited about the first groundbreaking and then ultimately the completion and then attending you know the bowling alley or the restaurants or the the retail spaces that go along with this so that's all thank you Mayor. one thing i would also like to mention which i think is important because of this specific project because it is homestead station and it involves uh, com commuter garages and the early part of 2018 the county is going to start making decisions on which rapid transit systems uh, which routes to approve funding for, the types of systems. So at some point early next year, we'd like to have a discussion with you all about whether you'd like to take a position on one of the, uh, one of the systems and uh, any kind of advocacy with the council because obviously uh, the, their decision-making process could come quicker and whatever impacts, whatever decisions they make on which system, obviously funding and starting the uh, South Dade Corridor is something that is a, a, a big deal for our downtown and for the city as a whole. Any other questions? This is a public hearing. You're welcome to come speak at this time on tab 11, <clears throat> site plan approval. Seeing none, close public hearing. Any final comments? Is there a motion? Moved and seconded. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilwoman Faircloth? Yes. Councilman Burgess? Yes. Councilman Ross? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Vice Mayor Shelley? Yes. Mayor Porter? Yes. The motion carries. Tab 12. Yes, tab 12 is a final order of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting certificate of use requested by Events Banquet Hall LLC to permit the on-premises consumption of alcoholic beverages and further granting a waiver of the location <coughs> requirements and a waiver of hours of the sale requirements for property located at 128, 128th and 144th Northeast 8th Street as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Mr. Cordino? Yes, sir. We're recommending approval of this item. Um, Again, this is a banquet hall, and, the, uh, and the, uh, the applicant is proposing to use some tenant space in an existing retail facility uh, as a banquet hall. And this would allow the on-premises consumption of alcoholic beverages in conjunction with the use. This use is regulated not only by the city of Homestead, but the state of Florida. In our code, we regulate um, restrictions on the sale of alcohol, um, and this, the sale of alcohol this, in this case, is being brought in by the people who are renting the facility, that they're not selling it themselves. It's brought in by an outside party. Um, so it's not being sold by the establishment to its patients. We talk about location restrictions and limits on hours of sale. We've reviewed this accordance to our code and feel that it will be compatible with the adjoining properties and determine that they have satisfied the criteria uh, for the uh, certificate of use, as well as the waiver of hours of sale and the waiver of location set forth in the code. So we're recommending approval. Questions from Council Vice Mayor? A question. So I noticed that the, the Planning and Zoning Board had three different votes on this. Is this something, is this a one vote or is this broken up? Did they choose to break that up so they could each take positions on different items? When, when this item uh, was brought forward to the PNZ, it was three separate items. Um, the certificate of use, then uh, uh, the waiver of hours and the waiver of location. For uh, ease of reference and convenience, we've assembled all of those together, but you all can certainly vote uh, if you want to take a separate vote on, on any of those items. Um, we can handle it that way. You can vote on the certificate of use, the waiver, and the location as they all have certain criteria as noted in the staff report. So, okay. um, and we'll just reflect, the final order will just reflect uh, whatever action you all decide to take with respect to those uh, 
items. Okay. Yeah, because personally, I mean, I, two out of the three, I'm 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 okay with the, the extension of the hours of sales from 1 a.m., which I think is our standard code, to 3 a.m. I'm I'm not supportive of. So I was just curious on whether or not it was going to be split up or whether it was an up and down overall. So that's kind of my position on it as as I speak without knowing any more information. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mayor. To uh, to uh, either the attorney or Mr. Cordino. What is the difference between a banquet hall and a bottle club? And, and what, what, what rights do they get that differ from one to the other uh, and then slash from a regular bar? I really believe that this, that this banquet hall and a bottle club are essentially the same thing. It's where people, the, the establishment is not selling alcohol to the patrons, but the patrons are bringing in alcohol. I think the difference is that a bar is selling alcohol to the patrons. So somebody rents a hall, they bring in their own, they bring in their own alcohol and, and use it for the event. And the owner of the facility is the one that uh, oversees the legal ages being ad adhered to, and that, or who 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 overlooks that? I believe that is the case. Yes, the the owner of the facility makes sure that everybody's legal. That take, I'll defer to the attorney, but they take the uh, insurance responsibility with all of that. And I too, as as the vice mayor, have concerns with it going until 3 a.m. So I don't. <clears throat> I guess we better, if we can, divide that out. Um, I, I I thought the same thing. I, I thought we should, you know, because I've or had. Or we can just make a motion and. and, yeah. and you can. We can definitely split it out. I mean, you know, just like you would if we had three separate items, we could hear. You could you could seek a motion on the certificate of use, and that would, you know, that that would entail. Um, whatever the code allows, and then you could hear and decide on the waiver of location and the waiver of hours. If granted, then they would be able to operate beyond the hours of operation. If, if the waiver of location is denied, the whole thing is dead because they have to get a waiver to be located within the specified uh, area close to a school. Mr. 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 Roth. Mr. Roth. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just have a comparison question. I guess it's line five or paragraph five on page two. Um, when it said the proposed use will be compatible with adjoining properties and surrounding neighborhoods, and in the middle of that struck in the middle of that paragraph, it talks about a hotel bordering a residential development which is outside of the city of Homestead. I'm not sure if that actually belongs in there as a description to a compatible uh, property. Um, and I know that the waiver for the location is, is a challenge because of the school. And I read through here that because of the hours of operation of the, 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 the banquet hall and the hours that the students would be present at the school, there didn't seem to be too much of a conflict there, so. I, I think I believe the, whole, the word hotel is an incorrect word. Uh, I think it's referencing this facility, but I, I believe that um, all of the other language in there is correct. On the north, the proposed hotel borders a residential development which is outside of the city of Homestead. Uh, outside the city of Homestead. However, extensive landscaping, including a six foot high wall, must be provided to create adequate privacy. And visual buffer. Joe, could you pull your mic down a little bit? I'm like that. I'm having a hard time here. Can you hear me now? It's a little better. Yes. So if it just needs to be corrected, I mean. I'll, I'll, well, let me go back and clarify that. That's all, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Miss um, Fairclaw. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a clarification <laughs> question for waiver of hours of sale to 3 a.m. We have another banquet hall in Homestead as well. I can't remember the name. It's off of 8th Street. Mm -hmm. What do they currently have? Is it Royal Royal Banquet Hall? I don't recall off the top of my head. I know that we've had in the past, over the years, um, there have been, I think, like two um, that um, were approved. But, but I can't remember the details specific to... Um, I don't think... I don't recall the waiver of uh, hours uh, with respect to that 
particular application. The applicant is here, perhaps they can um, answer the question. So basically, they're not selling alcohol to 3 a.m. They want to be able to serve alcohol until 3 a.m. And you have to think, this is a proposed banquet hall. If someone is renting it out for weddings, they don't want their wedding to have to end at 1 a.m. because they can no longer receive alcoholic beverages. So that's how I'm putting it into perspective. If the applicant wants to respond to that, it can potentially hurt their business if they're able, if they have to stop at one and not three, because who's going to, to want to rent the facility if they have to stop at 1 a.m.? So I don't see a big problem with it because I know the intent to be able to serve until 3 a.m. So perhaps the applicant, if you want to speak to, to, to weigh in on it. Just give us your name and address for the record, please. My address is 30240. I'm sorry. My uh, name is Olga Ivy. My address is 30240 Southwest 197 Avenue, Homestead, Florida, 33030. Thank you. Yeah, um, we are uh, asking about extending hours because we have uh, a lot of young people. They want to start their parties, their... their Weddings uh, at 9, 10 p.m. And we don't have anything here in Homestead to do that kind of business. So I'm, I am mother of two kids uh, and the same, uh, the, the age, they are getting married. And I see all the friends, they go to Miami because in Miami they had a, a, the, that time. They can open to 3 p.m. It doesn't mean we want to be open every day, every party to 3 p.m. It's when they require, they request that, we can provide a service. And if I can just follow up, I read in here that um, the off-duty police officers, security will, yes. will be there for crowd control or to provide security for the event, um, any events that you have there. So I, I don't have an issue with um, this waiver, um, this permitted use, and I'm going to support the recommendation of the um, PNZ board for this item. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, let me ask a, uh, a question of the attorney. Um, if, if an exception is given to stay open to a 3 a.m. time frame and there is a consistent problem with the police department and calls for service, what's the, what's the ramification? What, what, what would the city's option be at that point if there was a problem? Well, I, I think that we could probably place a condition that's uh, condition on the um, uh, the approval. If you if you were to approve the uh, the waiver, uh, we could uh, come up with some language, a condition that stipulates that um, you know if in the future uh, there becomes an issue with respect to calls for service related to the extended hours, the time frame past 1 a.m., uh, that um, the you all could revoke uh, the approval. Uh, and or uh, the applicant would be responsible to provide uh, off-duty police service um, at the location for that specified time frame. Like, you know, I, I think there's a valid point to, you know, sending all of our kids north to, because I, I know how kids are. Well, I think I know how kids are. Um, but they start late. You know, and that's the that's an issue that that I think is a is a kind of a problem because they don't start till ten eleven o'clock, and if it's a if it's a one o'clock closing time, it may it may force them out of the community, which puts them on the street, which sends the business elsewhere in this case. So, but it, but I would you know we have had some problems with parking lot activities after hours <coughs> in the old sports page, which was the bowling alley area. We had tremendous problem with. Um, I know, Chief, you remember we had shootings all the time, so we want to, I don't want to go into that world, but there's got to be, uh, we, hopefully there will be some sort of ability to check if, they, if we had a consistent problem with, with an operator, whoever that operator is. Maybe it's this operator, maybe it's another operator, but um, I just, I'd like to be able to see it work, you know, give it a chance to work, but I'd like to also be able to check it if we had a problem. Um, and I don't know how we do that, but I would suggest we craft something in there. Well, I think it would be it, it would it would be a combination of you know police, 
you know, periodic code enforcement. Certainly, if it becomes a problem, you're going to have police calls for service that um, we could monitor this and provide that if it becomes an issue that uh, certainly you all have the ability to revoke at any point the, the waiver to extend the hours, um, you know, as well as the final order uh, granting the certificate of use uh, and or the ability to require the uh, operator uh, to um, provide for uh, off-duty police uh, at the location in order to mitigate any uh, issues that could arise. This, this waiver goes to the operator or to the property? The way that this is drafted, it would go to the operator of the banquet hall okay. Okay. located at this property. So, I mean, it's specific for a banquet hall. I mean, it couldn't morph into anything other than this banquet hall. But if, if this operator, which we feel may or may not be a good operator, if they sold it to another operator. The code allows for transfers, as well as the state allows for there to be transfers of alcoholic beverage permits. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, you they could transfer, but they would take it subject to any conditions uh, that we would impose or, this, or subject to the approval of this final order. Thank you, sir. Ms. Fairclough? Three. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, what we don't want to do is hurt business. And if we approve two and not the extended hours, it's going to potentially hurt business because you have some patrons that won't even come until 11 o'clock and then it close at one. So that can potentially hurt business. And we don't want to do that. This board is not about that. So your recommendation, Mayor, with that condition in there regarding the calls for service, I think that's a good condition to put in there in the event that there are excessive calls for service, then I think we need to have the autonomy to go back and revisit that particular item. But I think we should move it forward tonight because we don't want to stifle business from our small business owners. I, I agree. And, and I want to, and the, the caveat is that the, the, the applicant tonight, we may have faith in this applicant, but if, right. if this goes to, you know, if it transfers to someone else, it's maybe not as uh, community oriented, we could have a potential problem down the road. Anything else, ma'am? That's it. Thank you. Mr. R Mr. Roth. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. With that being said, um, could it be conditioned that the, that could not be transferred? to a new operator, as we all know, this operator, and a new operator comes in, and we have no knowledge of who that person may be. And another thing to think about is <clears throat> this is not a sports bar, this is not a nightclub, this is not a restaurant. This is a private function uh, banquet hall. The majority of the people that will be partaking in this have rented this hall and invited friends, family, coworkers, and they all know each other. So it's a different atmosphere altogether than it would be for a, a sports bar or a, a restaurant or a nightclub or anything like that. Um, it, I'm getting older. I don't get out after 11 o'clock at night. <clears throat> if these guys want to travel to Miami and party till 3 o'clock in the morning, I think it's, uh, we're missing the boat, so to speak. And we need to keep our, 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 our youngsters in our area, having them spend money in our town, and... Uh, helping our small businesses as well. So mm -hmm. I can support the 3 a.m. so long as there's some conditions built into it that protect and give us an ability to uh, curtail what happens in that, in that, that uh, banquet hall. So uh, I could support the 3 a.m. Uh, part of this thing as well. So thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, uh, if, I mean, we, we can certainly place that um, as one of the conditions, would you all like it to uh, like the condition to provide uh, two options? You could just close the door to no transfer, or you could leave the door open to a transfer only upon the approval uh, of the council pursuant to a public hearing. Well, Mr. Roth, you had well, which I, I kind of like that idea too because. We've come across some of these issues where people have built these businesses up and because of things that have happened in the past, they weren't able to sell their businesses as they were without coming in. So maybe with an option to uh, be approved by this board, whoever may be sitting up here at that time would be an option as well. So not a, just a flat out no transfer, but 
a, the ability for whoever the governing body at that time, if there is a, a sale of the business, to at least come before us or whomever's here and give us an opportunity to talk to them as well. So uh, I would go for that, something like that as well. Thank you, sir. Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would like to ask an expert in this field and the chief who puts up with these type of things every day that, that we don't see the reports on or, or the calls for and see what his thoughts are uh, extending this pass to, to 3 a.m. And um, then my other question for you is, Chief, it says private or police security. Which one would you be most, most comfortable with in there uh, uh, I guess especially as the opening uh, until we see what exactly what's what's transpiring over there. Well, <clears throat> for number one, I I, uh, I totally agree with uh, the council, the councilwoman, and also uh, Councilman Roth. Uh, and one of the things that that was missing here tonight, and and we're talking about our kids, you're talking about you know keeping uh, in the city of Homestead, but also as, as a safety factor that that plays a big part in this. Because a lot of times our kids go out of go out of the county, out of the city. And I have a party, have drinks, and you know you can have problems getting back home that time of night. So I, I would rather keep them here as well. And the second part is that, uh, yes, we should start out with uh, the, the appropriate amount of police officers to make sure that you know the uh, facility is okay. Uh, normally, uh, you know you want to have take control of uh, what's going on in the beginning, not at the end, and that way you you stop a lot of lot of problems. So just hearing this and. Uh, Hearing everything been said tonight, you know, I don't, you know, I don't, I really don't have a problem with it. And it's always good to keep businesses in the city, like you all said. But uh, one of the things we need to think about is, as well is that, uh, you know, uh, we need to make sure that we take control of, of the situation, especially the parking lot, when any new business come in this town. Uh, just to let people know that, you know, we, we're not going to just accept anything. So thanks, Mr. Burgess. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. And, and, so, and he brought up one of my concerns is, at closing hour, you know, a lot of people kind of congregate and don't want to go home. And I just, I think that a, a police officer versus a private security guard is a more meaningful and more um, stronger message to the people that perhaps would gather there or, or, or linger around until they decide where they're going to continue on to. So. And and uh, Councilman Burgess, you know, not 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 a security officer, but all they're going to do is call the police. Mm -hmm. So why compound the problem? Just take care of it at one time, and right. it's pretty much, you know, it's pretty That's much That's my thought care. also. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, sir. Anything else, sir? Vice Mayor. Thank you. Yeah, I think with the discussion that we've had, I mean, with the conditions that are being discussed about being placed, and more specifically, I think Councilman Burgess's recommendation and the Chief's recommendation of a police officer makes me more comfortable knowing that we already have someone on site, we have somebody of authority on site, and we also have the ability to monitor in real time, not just waiting for enough calls to come in or enough people to complain, but you'll actually have an officer on site that's part of the city, that's part of our eyes and ears to see what's actually happening at this facility, at this banquet exactly. club. And, um, and that makes me feel more comfortable that, that we'll address any problems quickly that do come up, and, and I'd be more comfortable with the agreeing to the, to the extended hours at that time. And, and also, I'm, I may add, uh, if a problem occurred at night, I'm going to know about it that night. You know, we don't have to worry about uh, finding out later on because we, we do monitor any uh, any any business here in the city to make sure that you know the the, uh, the customers are safe. So thank you. Anything else, sir? That's all. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Roth. Thank you, Mayor. The um, kind of lost my train of thought for a second there, but the 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 applicant who's before us today maybe part of their agreement and this is something they may have to handle in house would be. Um, since these, this is a, a rental facility in your agreement, uh, you could make that party responsible for being off premises at a specific time or risk to lose the loss of their deposit as well for renting that facility. So you give them a three o'clock time frame, you give them a half hour, or whatever, that's between you to work that out. But that would also help you because you're making those people responsible for the behavior of their, their guests. So they wouldn't be hanging out as long. I, we, I'm sure we can't do anything about that for you, but. It's just a thought and idea to help our police department and help your business uh, in the future. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mayor. So I, I, to me, we need some clarification on page two, James and Mr. Corradino. 
under three, it says, staff, the banquet hall will not provoke excess excessive overcrowding or concentration of people or population. The events are pre-scheduled and applicant proffers at private or police security will be provided as necessary. What is as necessary? Do we have a number of people, a type of event, and hours that if it ends before 8, 8, 8 p.m., we don't need a police officer? What is as necessary? Or as required, depending on the size of the event. So what, are the, what, are the, what is the size of the event that determines how many or if any? We don't have a specific size in mind. We're leaving that up to the discretion of the operator. Uh, something that <clears throat> was unusual in size or extra large, uh, we would uh, suppose that they needed to have security there. Um, in fact, we could require them to have security there at all events for a period of time or re require them to have our police there. I, I don't think at two, uh, most likely at two o'clock in the afternoon event isn't a necessary. We may say all officer, nighttime right? events, all evening events going till 3, 3 a.m. We well, can I mean, I, I, I would like the applicant, maybe they can come up and clarify what um, what they what their thought might be too on that. Uh, you know, I think their thoughts are as important as ours as we try to work through this. <coughs> Only one person. Just one, just one lady, please. Just one, please. If she's not registered, she needs to go sit down. It will be in the evening time. Give us, your, give us your name and address for the record, sorry. please. Pull that microphone. Ana Pull that mic down to you. There you Ana go. Ana Santaella, 1661 Southeast 23rd Street. Um, we, pro we will provide the security and, and uh, the police um, um, when crowds, um, you know, when the crowds needed to. But what do you and in the evening the time. What do you consider the necessary number is what I'm trying to get at. Well, uh, when... When I said necessary, I I really meant uh, uh, if security. I mean, if it's 500 people venue, which is the capacity of the place, it it we would probably need. Um, uh, um, I, I we, wouldn't we, say probably. I would say definitely. We will definitely <laughs> need exactly. We will definitely need that police security at the end of the venue, probably to direct the traffic and all that. And we are counting on hiring those services, and we are counting on hiring security, because we want to keep and uh, this venue safe, and we want to keep the city of Homestead safe. I mean, we are not we are not planning in having. Uh, in fact, we will we will provide for a late night menu and water, um, um, and bottles of water when the when the when the when the people leave. So we will be watching really after not ha not having any inconvenience on this. Mayor, I I I mean I'm all for this. You know I I, I want to work with them, but I think that there's more discussion that needs to be had with staff and 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 these people. To answer the questions, when are the not, you know, we're going to look at it, and if 500 people are there, we're going to have security. I think we need to set precedents or put in place what we want to see to keep everything safe. And I don't think, <clears throat> and it's nothing, I don't know you people or your business or anything, but when we give people the opportunity, it never works out the way that we anticipate or hope for. And then we have problems down the road. So, uh, I think there's a lot of questions that need to be answered and worked out still in, 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 in this application. So I'll leave it at that. And, and my wish would be that they maybe come back next month with some of these answers um, well, with staff and, and our police department as, as maybe uh, the chief or, or Colonel Kennedy or, or, or Major... Uh, um. And the statute really does not provide for for any 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 um, amount of people per, per per security. Well, and but the statute doesn't we, say I, we have to I, give I, you the letter, hours letter, either. Letter, one at a time. We okay, could one also time. work on that um, as as it, it as it is required, and um, with the, you know with the help of the police department, and we will have our own security venue. You know, it's 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 workable. It's. Mm -hmm. What the plan is, because right now I'm not hearing a plan. 
I'm just hearing that you're going to have somebody. We're going to see what the numbers are. We're yeah, going to see what the activity the is. I don't hear a definite plan. I don't hear a plan in place yet. Okay. Let, let, me, let me interject something here. Um, I got a couple other comments, and, and we, we're going to need some clarification, okay? Um, Mr. Roth and then Ms. Ms. Mayor Claw. Mr. Roth. Uh, thank you, Mayor. The, 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 the banquet hall that may be active today, the one that's out on, uh, 18, I think it's 18th Avenue and uh, Campbell Drive, they only operate till 1 a.m. Is, is, does anybody know that? Are they open till 1 a.m.? And how many patrons can they support in any one event? Unfortunately, and, Councilman Roth, I don't have okay, that. Okay, that's fine. And Chief, that particular venue on 18th Avenue in the plaza there, have, do, do you, have you had any calls that you can recall, excessive calls for any kind of activities or anything? I mean, they may only go to 1 a.m., but has there been anything that you can recall? I, I, I don't recall any, any, uh, any problems there, because usually if it was some problems, you know, I, I know about it by now. Okay, so, uh, so I agree that there, there needs to be some clarity to what we're talking about up here. I don't know that it needs to drag on for months and months and months. And, you know, the size of the venue, the size of the, the, the amount of people that may show up there, um, or do we need security there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or only if they're having a party until 3 a.m.? Now, there's no security required and no police requirements at the facility that's on 18th Avenue and Campbell Drive. They never came before us and asked for an extension of time either. So yes. we didn't have an opportunity to even talk about it. Now, the debate is a two hour window of time. And I agree that we have to, 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 to take control of it at the beginning, but I'm not so sure what that control is, how we do it. Um, do we require them just to have security if a party is planned from 10 o'clock at night till three o'clock in the morning. Um, do we do it from a party that's required from you know, 5 p.m. to 11 p.m.? Um, you know, wh what are we up here trying to curtail? What are we trying to avoid uh, in this whole process? And we can, we, can, we can probably sit here all night and debate it and sit down with the applicant and, and come up with a, a, a solution, but it's a matter of time at this point. I, I understand that they're in the process of you know, trying to do their thing, get their place open, and to, to ask them to come back another time, can, can, can this be worked out without having to come back? Well, there's, there's too hold, many on, Jane. hold on, hold on yes. James. James. We, we, we could, you all could, uh, here, you all could vote on the waiver of location and the certificate of use this evening, which would give them the, the approval uh, for, the, for the banquet hall um, so that they could proceed with their business tax receipt in operation. And we could come back to you with respect to the waiver of location after having sat down with the applicant, exploring this a little bit more to address some of the concerns and issues you have had as well as with the chief and present something uh, back to you. Or alternatively, this can be deferred for a month and we can bring it back to you as a whole package next month. Couldn't, couldn't we just work the conditions out at this meeting and perhaps just say that we would notify the police uh, if there was going to be over 250 people booked in the location um, and the place was gonna be in operation between 10 and 3 a.m. And, and just make that a condition and move forward. Mr. Roth, you have the floor. I, I, you know, I don't have an objection to that, but how do you, how do you actually, I mean, is there, how do we control that? Is there a permitting process? There's no permitting process. I mean, they don't have to come to us and tell us what they're doing once we, once we let them out of here. Well, if we condition it, I believe that if we make that a condition that they need to notify our police department that if they're gonna have, they anticipate any more than half the capacity of the building um, to be in operation. If somebody rented the place between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m., maybe it. not an issue. Right. But if somebody rented the place to, through closing and they anticipated having over half the capacity, I think we condition it to say that they would notify our uh, police department 
and or pr provide private security, but it sounds like we would rather have our police department there because we have uh, more control over the situation. Actually, uh, after um, I find out that I'm going to have a party after 1 p.m., I come provide uh, the police, a police, always. So I have to request to the customers the, this, this, uh, that's going to be something they must have to do, to have a police uh, when we extend the hours. I don't have any issue with that. Is that the problem? The other thing I think is going to be safer for the home because the key, our kids, I am a mother, and I don't want my kids driving after. If they go to 1 p.m., they even drink the same thing. I don't think because you have more hours, you drink more. I think you drink what you, have, you are in mind to drink. Uh, what you have in mind to drink. I, I don't agree with the, because it's an extra hour. The extra hour is because the kids, they don't want to do the parties early. That's why, but no, because I don't want to be open actually to selling alcohol to anybody there. It's just the party. Joe, anything else, Mr. Roth? No, I'm good. Thank if, you. If, if we could, we're getting really complicated here with asking for, you, we're getting out of control here. What I think the two things that we're concerned about is, you know, the late hour and, and who controls it. We don't want security officers out there. We want police officers out there. So I think as a condition, we put police officers in the after the late hour events or all events. And, and, and then the second thing is, I think we need to have some position if there is a problem, a consistent problem in the parking lot, which may not have anything to do with, with but that's where we had all the problem in sports page. They would leave the event late at night, go out in the parking lot and shoot it up. And that was, you know, it's not going to be something that she has control over, but it's something that's going to be a problem for this community. So we've got to get our arms around that aspect of That's why I think if you have police officers there, they'll be able to an analysis of, of, the, of the crowd coming out, and they'll be able to make the call appropriately to head off any of that nonsense that goes on in the parking lots at 4 o'clock in the morning. So to me... I think that answers a lot of the issues. It lets, it lets her do her job. It gives, I think, us the, the ability to say, hey, we've put as many mechanisms in place to protect. And if, if she's willing to hire the, uh, you know, the police officers, I'm willing to give her the opportunity and, and the banquet hall the opportunity to have extended hours. But let's, let's have a fallback in case there's a failure, a major catastrophe, and it's decided by the police department. Not by, not by development services, not by the police department says, hey, we can't control this. Then it's a revocable issue for us. So the conditions would be that they hire a police officer anytime the facility is in operation after a certain hour, say midnight? Or say, how about? From one to three. From one to three, because those, those, that's the extension of time. And that if uh, the police department at any time uh, deems that the uh, facility is, is unsafe, that we have the ability to revoke their uh, certificate of use. That would be my wish. Um, Vice Mayor? I'm good for right now. No. <laughs> Mr. Roth, I cut you off there. Is there anything else? No, no, I'm good. That, we'll, we'll do as you guys advise. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> Ms. Eby, are you okay, Chief? I just felt reminded by uh, <clears throat> Major Sincor. The uh, officers have a three hour minimum. So we're gonna do it from from one to you said three. From, yeah, well, we're gonna start at, 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 at probably at, probably be like I said maybe twelve twelve to three. Yes. Which is three hour minimum, which would pretty much you know because you want somebody to be able to work it, and you know guys have a three hour minimum, so that would that would make it it work yeah. uh, mm -hmm. for for us. And then on top of that, mayor, we can always go up or down depending on the, the flavor of the of the uh, uh, the temperature of the situation. We've done that in the past, where if, if things uh, go sour, we, we have more police officers. If things go good, you know, we keep it like it is. That's, that's why the importance of having the police off duty there, because they're able to respond accordingly and Absolutely. call in the appropriate response that's to so whatever true. the issue is. That's so true. If it's a security guard service, they don't necessarily, maybe not have the ability to do that as quickly. So they, they won't. I, Ms. Fairclough. Just just one addition, I agree with everything that you just said. That's why I turned um, my request to speak off. But just one thing to, to note, generally when you rent banquet facilities, 
you have an hour before to prepare and an hour later That's true. to clean. So your patrons will have to perhaps be finished by 2 a.m. so that they can be out by 3. Because if they have until 3 a.m. to finish, then yeah, but you, you have close to the door. You close the door for the party and you right. kick everybody out at 3 o'clock. So and then I will be be keep there with my stuff after 3 p.m. cleaning and doing Okay. Whatever. I just wanted to, to note that. Not to complicate things any right. further. but We're not. But, but She's no, just no, I understand, but I want to, I, it's important for me to make this point is that this waiver only pertains to the consumption of alcohol. So the consumption of alcohol has to stop at 3 a.m. The place can stay open. We don't, the city doesn't control the hours of operation for facilities. So, so I just want to make sure we, we're talking about two different things, but if we need to condition with respect to that, if you're fine with that, if you're saying that yeah, at three okay. is the at three, I, I, I actually I think we can close the store at three three a.m. I think this is a pretty good time, and we don't have to serve anything food or drink anything after three three a.m. So there's a difference with service ending at three, people hanging out lagging for another hour. So that's. that's but that's why we're charging the police department and asking her to pay for off duty to be able to help regulate that because so so, so maybe one so maybe maybe 12 to 4 is the appropriate time frame for the off duty police officer to be on site we don't need to decide that necessarily as timing any you know, let, let let's let the chief and 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 the applicant work that out but i think we're we're extending the hours to 3 Letting him, letting them serve, or whatever, till three. We're getting our police officers in eyesight of what's going on, and they can be able to appropriately deal with whatever is or is not happening. I think that's the intent. That was my intent was to was to kind of be there. Ms. Ms. Faircloth. Yes. Let me just clarify. I wasn't confused with the hours for consumption and what we're voting on. I'm clear about that. I was bringing it to Ms. Ebby's attention that since we also discussed security, that that would have to be flushed out if you're hiring the officers from 12 until 3. Yeah. I'll if you're still giving them time, they're hanging out, you may want to, to deal with security until 4. Yes. I'm clear on the hours for consumption. I want to keep always the police. I want to keep, I think, the police always, they need to respect, respect and whatever. When the people drink, I, I, they see a police there, they will be, uh, behave better. Thank you. Anything else? Chief, anything else? No, sir. Okay, Ms. Evie, yeah. I think we're, we're good. Okay. Um, any other questions from council? This is a public hearing. I'll open up the public hearing at this time. Anyone would like to speak for or against, you're welcome to come at this time. Yes, sir. Hello, it's Javier again. Um, so these people want to get their kids married. They want to have a little spirits to drink. Uh, they're going to get their kids married. And they're going to sign off their kids to the government. The government's, no matter what, is going to make money off this. So why are you harassing this lady with Microsoft issues about all these little, tiny, little problems that everyone else seems to have uh, no problems with? Doesn't make any sense. You know, it's okay. You can look at me, Jeff. It's fine. It's um, okay. I, have I know you're busy, but yes, and I'm talking, and you're right in front of me. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I'll close, close the public hearing. Is there a motion? Move it. Mo motion as amended? As amended? We're going to do it as amended? Yes, sir. As amended, if we need to restate that, we, we can. Hold on. As amended, right? Yes. As amended, Larry? Yes, sir. Okay. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Yes. Councilman Burgess? Yes. Councilman Roth? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Vice Mayor Shelley, yes. Mayor Porter, yes. the motion carries. Motion carries. Tab 13. Mr. Attorney? One second, Mayor. 
<laughs> so tab 13, 14 pertain to the same uh, proposed development. There's also a corresponding uh, resolution, which is tab 23, which deals with the, a, a, a right-of-way deed for right-of-way uh, for this project. Mayor, if we, I could read all three of those. You can consider all those and vote on them. Okay. If that's, that's, that's good. Fine, okay. Tab 13 is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting a waiver of plat to DET Strategic Consultants, LLC for the division of property totaling approximately 1.9 acres generally located at the southwest corner of the intersection of South Homestead Boulevard, US 1, and Southeast 6th Street, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Tab 14 is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting site plan approval for a proposed 7,750 square foot O'Reilly's Auto Store, Auto Parts Store, on approximately 0.92 acre parcel, generally located at the southwest corner of the intersection of South Homestead Boulevard, US 1, and Southeast 6th Street, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. And the corresponding tab 23 is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, accepting a warranty deed conveying title for right of way purposes from 100 Southeast 6th Street, LLC, for property generally located at the southwest corner of the intersection of South Homestead Boulevard, US 1, and Southeast 6th Street, as additional right of way property needed for future right of way improvements and providing for an effective date. Joe, staff report on 14, 13. Yeah. Yes, sir. We are recommending approval of all three of the applications. On 13, we're dealing, like we said, with a waiver of plat request. In this one, um, the applicant is requesting this waiver of plat approval for the subdivision of approximately uh, 1.9 uh, acre rectangular shaped parcel located at this location. Um, what they plan on doing is to create two buildable commercial lots on the property, uh, which would be parcel A of about 0.93 acres, parcel B of a point, about 0.97 acres, and then they were going to use um, parcel A for the site plan, which is the O'Reilly Auto Parts Store. The final application, we needed a, 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 a deed to accept um, conveying some of the title for the right-of-way of the city that we could put utilities in. So we've reviewed each of these. They meet the criteria of our code, and we're recommending approval of each. Any questions on tab 13, 14, or 23 from council? Seeing none, I'll open up the public hearing on tab 13, 14, and 23. Any any. Anyone would like to speak for or against, you're welcome to come at this time. Close the public hearing. Any final comments on tab 13? Is there a motion? Is there a second? second. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilwoman Fairclough? Yes. Councilman Burgess? Yes. Councilman Roth? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Vice Mayor Shelley? Yes. Mayor Porter? Yes. The motion carries. Is there any final comments on 14? Is there a motion? Is there a second? second. Roll call. Councilman Ross? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilman Burgess? Yes. Councilwoman Fairclough? Yes. Vice Mayor Shelley? Yes. Mayor Porter? Yes. The motion carries. Uh, tab 23. Is there a motion on tab 23? Motion. Is there a second? Second. Roll call. Councilwoman Fairclough? Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilman Burgess? Yes. Councilman Roth? Yes. Vice Mayor Shelley? Yes. Mayor Porter? Yes. The motion carries. James? Yes, moving on to... James. Now, this is the issue that I have to recuse myself on? Yes, Mayor. Okay, so on, on tabs 15 and on tab 16. Okay? Yes. Vice Mayor? Turn you on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Says you're, you're lit up. That's okay. Oh, you're working now. Okay. Red means go. So, tab, uh, tab 15 <coughs> is an ordinance of the City of Homestead, Florida, amending a previously approved special use permit granted to First National Bank of Homestead pursuant to ordinance number 871075 
by modifying the permitted use from bank clerical office space to office and deleting the five-year time period related to restrictions on rear access for properties located at 48, 82, and 90 Northwest 17th Street as legally described in Exhibit A, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. This is first reading. Staff report, yeah. Yes, sir. We are... <clears throat> We are recommending approval of, of this, uh, this uh, amendment of the special use permit. Effectively, what's happening in here is the bank wants to be able to sell uh, a couple of properties on both this one and, and the next application. Here, they, they simply want to disconnect themselves. When we, when we made the, uh, the permit, um, they said that the clerical office space needed to be associated with the bank. What we're simply doing is just saying it can remain clerical office space. It just doesn't need to be associated with the bank so it could be um, a, a clerical office space for any other business in place. The intent is that it really, I believe in this one, that it shouldn't be more uh, anything more intense than office space uh, in a B1A. This is the B1A, right? This is the B1A uh, use, which is the lowest level of business activity that we can get. Uh, I think that we, we had spoken with the uh, vice mayor and, and need to clarify that in, in our uh, resolution, but I'll let it, you speak to that. Yeah, my, my concern was um, if you look at section two of the proposed uh, new special exception or the amendments to the current special exception, in there it has a bracket that says a B1 use in a P zone. And so my concern was, and I spoke with James and with Joe about, was that would it somehow allow for a backdoor way of this property now being, allowing B1 uses in a B1A area? Uh, because before it was tied to the bank, so likely the bank wasn't gonna do anything that was gonna be intensive like a gas station or something else that could be in a B1. Uh, but now that you remove that, that limitation of bank and it's open-ended, my concern is that B1 now could cause us problems. And that neighborhood has already contacted me once they got the notification of the public hearing that they were concerned about what that might do. Uh, was it something to be concerned about? And we recently had them all show up, uh, I guess about a year ago or so now, a couple months ago when they had the prior B1 zoning that was coming before us. And so they're very concerned. So I'm also also very concerned about that. And so what I had, what I would like to do, what I'd recommend is to change or amend it um, to say a B1A use and a P zone because that's currently what the zoning is, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, and then one of the concerns too is the current use that's already in existence there is, is, um, is valid, is legal within a B1A use. So by doing this, it doesn't affect the purpose for which the applicant is changing um, this particular special exception. Yes, sir. Okay. And so that's what I'd like to, to um, make a recommendation of. Any questions from council? No? This is a public hearing, I'll open the... Thank you, Vice Mayor. So you're just trying to restrict and make sure that there's no other heavier uses than what is there now. You're going to allow what's there now to be able to stay in the building. But once that person leaves, then there's no changes. It would have to go back to a, a, a B1A. If the person that's in there now is, is possibly doesn't fall under that category. And, and uh, when they leave, it would have to revert back. It wouldn't be able to stay as a special exception there at all. Uh, well, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, that the current special exception that we were potentially going to pass tonight, if it was stated to have B1A, would have no um, effect on the current tenant or the current operation or use of that particular building. And so therefore, if they changed ownership <coughs> later, if the current applicant were to sell it, uh, to a new buyer, that that buyer it would not have any difference or any effect. They wouldn't lose rights or gain rights. It would do whatever, whatever they currently have the ability to do now. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Great. Are you? Look I'm sorry. It's, it's technology here. Last time I did this, it was just paper and pencil. So this is <laughs> this is a lot more complicated. Uh, I think I was on. No other further questions from council. I open the public hearing. Any questions or comments from the public? Mr. Vice Mayor, Council Members, um, Michael J. Marcus, Marcus and Marcus, PA, 200 Northeast Chrome, or Northeast Second Drive. Um, I was a flashback to uh, 20 years ago. I, um, I'm here on behalf of the uh, Center State uh, Bank of Florida, NA, 
the applicant in this particular situation and, and uh, Vice Mayor Shelley, we don't have any objections to, uh, to your amendment. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? I'm staying ready. Okay, all right, thank you. Do we need to make an amendment to this? Do I need to make a motion for an amendment if I want that B1 to be changed to B1A? Okay. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll make a motion to amend from B1 to B1A in that respective section of Section 2 within the parentheses. Do I have a second? Second. I still have, it's still public comment. Any, any further public comment? Seeing none, I've closed the public comment. Any further questions from Council? Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Roth? Yes. Councilman Burgess? Yes. Councilwoman Faircloth? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey, yes. Vice Mayor Shelley, yes. the motion carries. Tab 16. Yes, moving on to tab 16. Tab 16 is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, approving the request by Center State Bank, Florida NA, for a modification and amendment to the covenant running with the land recorded in Miami-Dade County Official Records Book 13719 at page 1487 for property located at 104 through 128 Northwest 16th Street and 151 Northwest 15th Street and providing for an effective date. Yes, sir. We uh, recommend approval of this as well. It's very much the same situation uh, where they're simply just disconnecting the uh, requirement that uh, the uses shall be limited to uh, B1A associated with the bank. And it uh, no longer has to be associated with the bank, be associated anything, but this one specifically B1A uses. Okay. Any questions from council? See no questions. It's a public comment. I open the floor to public comment. Vice Mayor, Council Members, uh, and again, this is for the record, Michael J. Marcus, Marcus Marcus, PA, uh, 200 Northeast 2nd Drive in Homestead, on behalf of the applicant. Appreciate being here. All right, thank you. Any further public comment? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Any further questions from Council? Roll call, Madam Clerk. Motion, please. Second. I'll move. Oh, do I have a motion? Second. Second. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Ross? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilman Burgess? Yes. Councilwoman Faircloth? Yes. Vice Mayor Shelley? Yes. The motion carries. Tab 17. Tab 17 is an ordinance of the City of Homestead, Florida, amending the City Code by amending Chapter 30 Zoning, Article 4, Supplemental District Regulations, Division 2, Off-Street Parking, to modify and establish voluntary regulations for military and veteran persons' parking spaces, providing for severability, providing for inclusion in the code, providing for conflicts, and providing for an effective date. This is second and final reading. Staff report. Sir, we're, we're, rec we're recommending approval of this item. This is the second reading, so we've heard it before. And what we're doing is we're creating a, a voluntary program for, to encourage um, a, a vet a veteran parking spaces for military and veteran people to use in the commercial districts. We have in our ordinance set out um, if somebody was to take advantage of this, uh, this voluntary action, how many spaces they may want to provide based on the size of the lot, and we've designed some signage as well. So we're recommending approval. Any questions from council? Just as a reminder, this is one of the initiatives that the Military Affairs Committee had brought forward uh, to me and that I'd brought to council uh, as far as trying to be prove or show our military friendliness here within the city of Homestead and, and the voluntary nature of it makes it that the property owner and the business owners can elect to engage in this, but they're not required to do so, uh, so that it doesn't have any type of uh, monetary effect on, on the businesses. So. Uh, any, open the floor to public comment. Any public comment for or against? Seeing no public comment, I'll close the public comment. Uh, any further questions Wait, from the council? Oh, go ahead, it's too fast. Um, Jason Jensen, um, 32320 Southwest 199. Um, I am for this amendment as it helps veterans. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Any additional public comment? Seeing none, I'll close the public comment. Do I have a motion? <laughs> Move, do I have a second? second. Moved and second it. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Burgess? Yes. Councilman Roth? Yes. Councilwoman Fairclough? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Vice Mayor Shelley? Yes. Mayor Porter? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Tab 18. Right. Tab 18. Tab 18 is an ordinance of the City of Homestead, Florida, adopting the modified and updated capital improvement plan containing the capital improvement element of the City of Homestead Comprehensive Plan as required under Chapter 163, Part 2, Florida Statutes, providing for adoption pursuant to Section 163-3177, Florida Statutes, providing for inclusion in the City of Homestead Comprehensive Plan, providing for repeal of conflicts, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. This is first reading. That report. Mayor, the city is required to annually approve and update the five-year SIC, SCI to the CIE. Table 1A, five-year capital improvements of the CIE has been updated pursuant to adopted policy and elements objectives. Table 1A has been updated to reflect cost estimates for water and wastewater drainage, solid waste and transportation projects, including Homestead Multimodal Transit Center, covering the 2017 to 2022 timeframe. Staff recommends Mayor and Council approve the proposed ordinance, ordinance updating the five-year capital improvements to the capital improvements element of the city's comprehensive plan pursuant to section 163-163.31773B Florida statutes. Questions from Council? I'll open up the public hearing. This is a public hearing. Anyone would like to speak for or against this modification? <clears throat> Excuse me. You're welcome to come at this time. Close the public hearing. Any final comments from council? Is there a motion? Moved, Moved and seconded. Roll, roll call, Madam Clerk. Yes. Councilwoman Roth? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilman Burgess? Yes. Vice Mayor Shelley? Yes. Mayor Porter? Yes. The motion carries. Tab 19. Mr. Manager? Mr. Attorney. Uh, Mr. Mayor, for first reading, we have an ordinance of the City of Homestead, Florida, amending the budgets for each of several funds and departments of the city for fiscal year beginning October 1, 2016 and ending September 30th, 2017, by increasing the total budgeted revenues and expenditures by $10 million, providing for a repealer, severability, and an effective date. Mr. Manager. Mayor, the purpose of this amendment is to appropriate $1 million from the general fund, $1.3 million from electric utility, $2.7 million in the hurricane fee from solid waste fund, and transfer the total of $5 million into the disaster relief fund for the expenses incurred in fiscal year 2017 as a result of Hurricane Irma. Through September 30th, 2017, the city has incurred approximately $5 million in disaster-related expenses. The city does anticipate being able to recover most of those expenditures through FEMA reimbursements. However, at this time, because no funds were awarded to the city prior to the year end, we must provide an alternative source of fundings from the existing resources identified above. Once FEMA reimbursements are realized, these funds will be reimbursed accordingly. The hurricane fund, which has been assessed for such purposes, has a balance of approximately $2.7 million. For debris clearance and other expenses, the balance needed is requested from electric utility and the general fund. Staff recommends mayor and council approve the amend to amend approve and amend the fiscal year 2017 budget for the transfer from general fund electric utility and solid waste into disaster relief fund as per attached schedule. And as you all know, we get the question each year about what's the $1 for and how much do you need? Why do you keep collecting it? This is a good example of we've collected 2.7 million, but our expenses were $5, .5 million. So that $1 million is helpful, but Thankfully, you still, you know, we we're, are eligible for FEMA reimbursements, but that fund is obviously there for a reason, and it's really a drop in the bucket when you have a really major event. Questions from council? I'd ask you for a second dollar, but I don't think I'm going to get it tonight, gonna get so it. I'm going to no, just leave it at it. I'm not going to get it. You aren't either, Carlos. <laughs> um, I'll open up the public hearing at this time. Anyone would like to speak, you're welcome to come forward. Hurricane Irma relief. Seeing none, close the public hearing. Is there a motion? 
Move it. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Mr. <coughs> Woman Fairclough? Yes. Councilman Ron? Yes. Councilman Burgess? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Vice Mayor Shelley? Yes. Mayor Porter? Yes. The motion carries. Tab 20. Mr. Mayor, again for first reading, we have an ordinance of the City of Homestead, Florida, amending the budgets for each of the several funds and departments of the city for fiscal year beginning October 1, 2017 and ending September 30th, 2018, by increasing the total budgeted revenues and expenditures by $53,445,065, providing for a repealer, severability, and an effective date. A report from staff, Mr. Manager. Mayor, the purpose of this amendment is to roll the amounts encumbered primarily for ongoing capital projects at fiscal year end 2017 into the current fiscal year's budget. This amendment is done annually during the month of November. Staff recommends the Mayor and Council approve and amend the fiscal year 2018 budget for various funds as per the attached schedule. And this is projects that were budgeted but aren't completed, so they, they get rolled over until, like the parking garage, for example, that'll be completed in 14 months, so you roll over until the project is done. Questions from council? I'll open up the public hearing. Anyone would like to speak for or against tab 20? You're welcome to come at this time. <clears throat> yes, sir. Give us your name and address for the record, please. Um, Alberto Carlos Diaz, 30805 Southwest 214th Avenue, 33030. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering how much transparency does the public get into exactly what you're spending 53 million some dollars on? Because that's it. that's that's a lot. That's, that's a crazy amount of money. I mean, that's you can build a small space station with that amount of money. Um, I, I was wondering, you know, if how much transparency the public will get if you guys could answer any questions, but I guess this is just me asking blindly to you guys. So I'm going to just leave it at that for public record because that's a crazy amount of money and I don't think you guys should go through with it because just vote no, please. That's that's a lot. No reason, but thank you. Thank Have you, sir. One. Mr. Manager, would you just uh, briefly, I mean, $53 million, it's the total total budget I mean it's Carlos we go on the transparency question these items the backup materials on the uh, on the website and certainly it's open for public uh, record and inspection these are all basically projects that have come before you and have been approved previously the big, biggest example like the manager mentioned is the 33.3 million dollars for the multimodal transit center so those funds, those were the bonds that were issued, the money that's still available, the construction is going to be beginning in January, and it'll take 14 to 16 months. So that's a perfect example of one of them. Another was Pump Station 1. That project's still ongoing. There's still about $4.1 million left on that project, and so on. Again, these are all projects that in most cases have been before you and have been, been approved by, by council. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. A close of public hearing. Any final comments or questions from the council? Is there a motion? Is there a second? Second. Second. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Ross? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilwoman Faircloth? Yes. Councilman Burgess? Yes. Vice Mayor Shelley? Yes. Mayor Porter? Yes. The motion carries. Tab 21. Ma Mr. Manor. Mayor, according to Florida Statute 166, Point two four one section four a appropriation for expenditures with a fund may de be decreased or increased by motion recorded in the minutes if the total appropriation of the fund is not changed any amendments to prior year's budget must be done within 60 days after the fiscal year end throughout the fiscal year some departments within the general fund incurred the expenses for reasons detailed in exhibit one that were not contemplated during the budget process appropriation for those departments is required to be amended but the total appropriations of the general fund will not be affected. This amendment is usually done annually during the month of November. Staff recommends Mayor and Council approve and amend the appropriations for departments within general fund for fiscal year 2017 budget as per attached exhibit one. Total budget for the general fund will not be affected. Questions from Council? 
This is a public hearing. I'll open up the public hearing at this time. You're welcome to come forward. Seeing none, close the public hearing. Any final comments, questions from council? Is there a motion? Is there a second? Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilwoman Fearclaw? Yes. Councilman Burgess? Yes. Councilman Roth? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Vice Mayor Shelley? Yes. Mayor Porter? Yes. The motion carries. Tab 22. Mayor, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development has significantly revised the assessment of fair housing requirements in connection with the consolidated plan process. The process of assessing fair housing now requires program participants to assess four fair housing issues, patterns of integration and segregation, racially or ethnically concentrated areas of poverty, disparities in access to opportunity, and disproportionate housing needs. HUD recognizes the significant level of effort that will be required to successfully meet the new requirements and encourages collaboration in order to share the cost and workload of the process. The attached memorandum describes in further detail the collaboration process. Upon approval of this recommendation, staff will move forward in the preparation of the agreement and present the final document of the December Committee of the Whole meeting. Staff recommends the city enter into a collaboration agreement with Miami-Dade County for the new assessment of fair housing, which will be completed in 2020. Questions from council? This is a public hearing. I'll open up the public hearing. Tab 22, close the public hearing. Um, Mr. Manager, the only th I looked at the list. Uh, could we just reach out to Homestead Housing Authority, make sure that they know this might be an option for them as well? They're included, okay, okay. <coughs> Any final comments, questions from council? Is there a motion? Move it. Is there a second? second. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Burgess? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilman Ross? Yes. Councilwoman Fairclaw? Yes. Vice Mayor Shelley? Yes. Mayor Porter? Yes. The motion carries. Uh, tab 25. Resolution. Res Resolution? Oh. Mr. Mayor, there's a resolution of the City Council of the City of Homestead, Florida, authorizing the purchase of multi-band radios for the City of Homestead Police Department from Cooper General Corporation, pursuant to City Code Section 2-411.1A5, exemptions from competitive bidding, providing for an effective date. Mr. Manager. Mayor, staff recommends the Mayor and Council approve the attached resolution authorizing City Manager to purchase multi-band radios for the Homestead Police Department from Cooper General Corporation. The purchase is made in accordance, accordance with the school board, Miami-Dade County, Miami-Dade County contract. Total purchase amount $89,366.50. Any questions from Council? This, this Radio system allows you to, to talk to other agencies. Is that what it is? Okay. Any questions from council? I'll open up the public hearing at this time, buying radios for the police department. Close the public hearing. Is there a motion? Is there a second? second. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilwoman Fairclaw? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilman Burgess? Yes. Councilman Roth, yes. Vice Mayor Shelley, yes. Mayor Porter, yes. the motion carries. Okay, so we're gonna take your two tabs, um, Ms. Fairclaw and Mr. Burgess under your business, correct? Okay, so at this time I'll open up the public, uh, public comment section of the meeting. I've got a few cards here. Mr. Sullivan, did you get to say Just give us your name and address, standard procedure. Kevin Sullivan, 1860 Southeast Sixth Court. I'm here tonight, first off, to welcome the newest member of the council, Miss Bailey. It's a pleasure to see you up there. You're very quiet, though. I can't hear you in the back. But I think we all should take recognition of what went on in this town when the hurricane hit and how our public utilities and our public works department worked tirelessly to get us back up and running. It's not my first storm here, unfortunately, but uh, I have never seen a response any better than it was in this storm here. So it's a credit to the people that are working for the city, and it's a credit to you people that are out there 
driving around, making sure the job gets done. Thank you. Um, Ricky was with Axiom. He's not here, I don't think, anymore, so no. Mr. McDonough. Hello, my name is Dr. James Eric McDonough. I live at 32320 Southwest 199th Avenue. Let me begin by offering heartfelt congratulations to Jennifer Bailey on winning the election. Jennifer, we love you. We have great hopes for you in this city. We hope that you'll be able to pull off the same special magic you conjure while helping to raise our children to righteously raise the city and council. Next, uh, sincere thanks must be given to the city's public information officer, Zachary Good. Not only for his kind and polite demeanor, but for his forthright honesty, particularly on two exemplary points. First, for admitting to unlawful government censorship by hiding the critical comments of me and others from the city's Facebook page. It must be assumed that Manager Gretzis ordered Mr. Good to do this. Additionally, it's noted that the mayor and police department also hid and or deleted my comments from their respective Facebook pages as well. Yet, Manager Gretzis continues insinuating that I falsely claim his employees have violated the law. Second, I also must thank Mr. Good for his admission concerning a most troubling false statement given to the media. This statement purposely defamed my good friend Kim Hill and me. After we were both unlawfully trespassed from the city hall for simply daring to exercise our rights to freedom of speech, press, assembly, and petition. To not misquote Mr. Good explaining the source of this liable statement, let me paint an excerpt of his deposition for you. Technical difficulties, give me just a second, we'll have it. Hi, Amber. Please see below statement from the city. Quote, neither of these two individuals are residents of the city. There is a lot more to this than meets the eye, and the city will have more to say when we are able to. This is a pending criminal matter which involves more than just what happened at the council meeting, and therefore the city will not be able to comment at this time. Dr. McDonough has filed numerous lawsuits and has a history of suing people, including the state attorney, the director of Miami-Dade County Police, and 11 police departments. His history should speak for itself. Mr. Hill's racist comments aimed at our police chief, who is African-American, and our police chaplain, who is also African-American, have no place in any civil public forum. Did you draft this statement? I took it by dictation. Can I ask who gave you that statement? Yes, that was Mr. Gretzis. Mr. Gretzis, okay. Now that the evidence has been presented, it's obvious to see that not only have we not been falsely accusing city employees of crimes and civil rights violations as alleged, but in fact, it is city manager George Gretzis who is the bald-faced liar. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you. Um, that's, I can't read it. Pass it. Ms. Wood, Mr. Wood. Benzina Wood, Armando, <clears throat> just give us your name and address, please, sir. Armando Belmontes, 4 North Chrome Avenue. <coughs> Thank you. The reason why I'm here is because um, I this is my second time coming here before trying to reach you guys to talk to somebody regarding the parking situation with the Seminole Theater. You guys go and block off the whole front of my building along with the Seminole Theater, which gives us no access to parking. And then they block off the back part for, them, for access for them. You know, it's becoming a problem where we can't unload without them coming out complaining to us. All right, from what my understanding, that's a loading dock, which is you unload and get out. They block my kitchen doors, you know, and I've been quiet about it, but it's already gotten to a point where now you guys went and put tollway signs in the back, and now they're just like, they're waiting for us to park in the back to call the tow truck. You know, I think that's already too much that we're not able to work together since we're neighbors there. 
you know, I've been trying to get in contact with somebody that can fix the situation or how can we go about the situation, you know, before we start, you know, having confrontations there for, for unnecessary problems that we don't need, you know. We're not here to be causing problems. We, you know, we've been there longer than the Seminole Theater's been there, and meaning on the operation part. So, you know, so we, I think we, we should deserve some respect for being there, you know, not just being ignored. You know, we're there also struggling the same way as any business down here, trying to make it happen. You know, but fortunately, it's like we're being ignored there. You know, like there's no respect towards us there. So I wanted to see who can I speak to regarding that situation, or how can we come um, come an agreement on something there, or you know, a mutual thing that we can work out where there's no card being told or any of that type of things. You know, that's it. Okay. Um, Mr. Manager, I'm gonna I'm gonna give this card forward this card to you. It's got address and information. Okay. Um, that's all the cards that I have. So I'm gonna close the public uh, comment section at this time. Business. I don't have it, sir. What, what was your issue that you wanted to speak on? Just public comment? <laughs> well, I don't have a card. Madam Clerk, did, did he meet the deadline? Do you have any idea? Oh, so the card, he didn't fill out the card. Okay. Okay. So you have to fill the card out yourself. I did. Um... Staff said it was given to them by Mr. McDonough. Okay, so we're not accepting anybody else filling out cards for people to come and speak. The person that wants to speak is the one that's required to fill out the card, correct? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, hold on a second. I'm gonna, the, the position is, we're not taking cards that are filled out by somebody else other than the person that's here. It's the clerk and the staff has told me that this card was not filled out by the gentleman. So we're gonna proceed. Public comment section is closed. I need to go to the business of the city manager. Mr. Manager. Mayor, no, uh, no report tonight. Business from the city attorney. Did you do it? <laughs> um, Mr. Mayor, I have to request a couple of executive sessions. One in the matter of City of Homestead, Florida v. the Homestead Miami Speedway, case number 16-231-AP. Um, the other in Homestead Miami Speedway v. City of Homestead, um, it's the FLUAC proceeding, case number APP-16-002. And... Um, the final is McDonough v. the City of Homestead, U.S. Uh, Dis District Court, case number 117-CV-23227. That's it. That's it. Thank you, sir. Reports from Mayor and Council. Uh, Ms. Fairclaw, and your, your tab 26. Bye. Sorry, Thank no. you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to invite Education Committee member Desiree Chase to come to the podium, but before she brings her remarks, I would just like to add some context to this. The City of Homestead has an education compact with Miami-Dade County Public Schools, just like several municipalities have compacts with Miami-Dade County Public Schools, and it's basically a non-binding agreement, and both um, entities have different initiatives that they would work collaboratively on. So each year, the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs Grants Administration 
um, visits education committees that they have compacts with to request support for their Miami-Dade County <coughs> Public Schools legislative priority items. So the education committee spoke with um, the representative from the school district regarding the priorities and the education committee requested that the city draft a resolution to support some of the priorities. And I would like to invite um, Desiree Chase, education committee member, to discuss further. Good evening. You know the drill. Desiree Chase, 1748 Northeast 8th Street, Apartment A, Homestead, Florida, 33033. Thank you. Good evening, council members. My name is as stated is Desiree Chase. I'm not only a proud resident of the city of Homestead, but I'm also a local science teacher at the Medical Academy for Science and Technology, Mast at Homestead. You may have seen us yesterday on Channel 6. And I am also a proud member of the Education Advisory Board. The committee respectfully requests that the council support our recommendations as it relates to the selected legislative items for Miami-Dade County Public Schools. The selected legislative items are in response to House Bill 7069 and its potential impact on City of Homestead students, both in public and charter schools. We are concerned and we are very grateful to Miami-Dade County Public Schools for communicating with us um, the impact that this could make on the city of Homestead. So we hope that you take into consideration the recommendations we have made. Thank you, Ms. Chase. And I, I would like to point out something. In the agenda, you will have a list of the 2018 state legislative priority positions, all of the positions for Miami-Dade County Public Schools. But it's important to note that the Education Committee only are recommending select priorities from the district, not all of them. That is, that is correct. I just wanted to highlight that. We want to be very particular to the city of Homestead. So um, that is why we were very particular in our selection of what to recommend to the council. Thank you, and this is to ensure that the recommendation from the Education Committee and the potential resolution from this board positively impacts public and charter schools, not exclusive to public schools. So I want that very important distinction. Thank you, Ms. Chase. Thank you. That's it. So I would rec there's a resolution in um, the agenda item, and I would request on behalf of the Education Committee a favorable um, approval of this resolution. I'm going to, Vice Mayor, did you have a question? Just on, on Section 3 distribution, um, it talks about Representative McGee, Senator Flores, but it's missing Representative Rashon, who also represents this area. I think it's good oh, for okay. her to be sent to her as well. Thank you for that. So this is properly agended, Mr. Turney. So we can offer a motion to accept this resolution, move this resolution? I, I think that we had discussed this being placed on the discussion, but we can move it. I, move it. Was the intent to move it tonight? Can move it tonight. I think everybody's had ample opportunity to look at it. There's no surprise here, and it's properly agended. And the direction would be, I need a motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Anything else, Ms. Perkel? No, that's it for me, ma'am. Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mayor and fellow council. Members, um, as you know, back in August, I was appointed to the uh, Florida League of Cities Executive Committee, and we have um, six key points that we're uh, either in a, for or against from the Florida League of Cities, and those are on the agenda tonight, too. And next week, I will be attending our um, uh, legislative action day, or not le le legislative planning days, and I would be very happy to take home or take up there with me the uh, six resolutions that we have either in favor or in against um, to give to them to show our support in the in the uh, favor of the uh, Florida League of Cities as we all know they do great work for us up in Tallahassee you know one of them is to save our CRAs again as we uh, myself and 
several other council members years ago walked the halls for two or three days and made various trips up there. And once again, the CRAs are under attack. And our CRA is a very important part of our downtown revitalization now. So I think it's very important that we at least take that one in support tonight and <clears throat> bring it forward. And, um, one other thing that you guys may or may not know is that you can sign up and they'll send you leg legislative alerts. And when a bill, certain bill is coming up, they will tell you to call uh, and they'll give you a list of people to call uh, and, and show either support or be against. Um, and those calls are very, very important to, to the city and to the league as, as when you call representatives that may not know who you are, but they understand the importance of, of the calls that are being made to them. So not just to our representatives that we have constant contact with here, but representatives from the Panhandle, Central Florida, the, Gulf, uh, the Gold Coast, and other regions. So um, I would like tonight, if we could, to possibly pass the uh, six resolutions we have here um, with a simple yay vote and, and bring these forward as I continue on next week to the, to the league and show them that we are doing the good fight and, uh, and appreciate the help that they give us and show our support for what they have recommended. Is there a second to the motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. They Thank do a you. great job. Great Thank job you. for us. And that's all I have for tonight. Thank you, sir. Mr. Roth. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just have one uh, thing, and I just wanted to talk about the uh, Shop with a Cop program coming up in this month, December the 13th. Uh, this is for the kids, is able to fund 40 kids, along with Homestead's finest police officers who have signed up to Shop with a Cop this year. Um, at our local Walmart on 137 and 288. Anybody can join us if they'd like to come out and see this. If you haven't been a part of a Shop of the Cop program before, uh, you don't know what you're going to experience until you walk with these kids that are hand-in-hand -hand with some of these police officers that donate their time to spread some joy to kids that may not even have experienced a Christmas. Uh, this is for the Kids, Inc., provides a $100 gift card for each of the children that participate, which the children are selected by SOS, which is a part of the Homestead Police Department. And I, I, I thank you, Chief Roll, for your support in, in this, this program that we do. Um, uh, if you get an opportunity to come out and just see us and, and experience what these children see as they're standing with these police officers in line, they've got shop their shopping carts are full of toys and goodies and stuff. Uh, there's nothing more rewarding than actually being there and watching this and witnessing this for the first time. Um, Chief's been there with us for the last two years. This is our third year doing it. And uh, we welcome anybody to come out and experience this with us, take pictures, and it's, it's just a lot of fun. Uh, we started this you know, two years ago when this country was, was, was saturated with bad news about police officers and communities. And we wanted to show um, our officers and our community that we're different down here. We care about our people in the city of Homestead. We care about our residents down here. And the police officers care just as much for our community and our children as, as all of us do. And Chief, thank you for the opportunity to do this and allowing your officers to join us each year. And as long as we can continue to do this and the officers want to do this with us, we're going to try to fund it as much as we can. And I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Ms. Bailey. Nothing right now. Nothing. Thank you. Vice Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Just one, one quick item. I wanted to ask this. Okay. Well, <laughs> Ms. Fairclaw. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. Councilman Roth, the Education Committee had discussed a couple of months ago the Shop with the Cop program and wanted to participate um, in the program by funding, participate, um, selecting students to fund, to tag along with your group to participate in Shop with the Cop. So if you would allow us and the Education Committee, we'd love to partner with you in that effort. Be happy to, to talk about the role. Uh, I've, I've, I've given Sandy with SOS the, the ability to choose, you know, children and whatnot. And 
the, the funding part of it is great, and, and, and I'm, I'm so appreciative that, that you want to, and I hope you'll be there as well to see oh, this. Yes, this I'll is an there. amazing event, and um, I just don't know what our capacity is with the volunteer officers and things like that as well. I'm sure Chief can help make that happen. We'll get some more officers. <laughs> Chief. We're having a party. <laughs> we, would, we would like to participate in the Shop with the Cop program. The Education Committee would like to fund some children to tag along in addition to the 40 that has been identified. But the concern is the amount of officers. So I'm sure we can get some more officers to participate to accommodate. We'll double yes, up. Yes. We'll, we'll make it work. Whatever we'll it make it happen. We'll make it happen. Very good. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vice Mayor. Thank you. Just uh, one quick announcement, and that is the Homestead National Parks trolley kicked off this past weekend um, after Thanksgiving to start its, I think it's sixth season at this point in time, or fifth, sixth. So we're in the fifth or sixth season. It, it's been going on for a while now. Each year we, we make it bigger and better. Um, and this, you know, the, for those that aren't familiar with it, you can catch the trolley free of charge from downtown Homestead and take it to Everglades National Park, Biscay National Park, or Homestead Bayfront Park. And that runs from now through um, I think May, the end of April, 1st of May, depending on when the weekend falls. And this year we've added two more things. Uh, last year we kind of tentatively added the water trolley. So you could take the downtown trolley to Biscay National Park and then hop on a water trolley for a small fee that would take you out to Boca Chita and back so you could spend the day on the water. And that was something that was um, added last year and then full force effect this year. And so I think they have two or three boat rides each day, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then some during the week. But for the trolley purposes, it's Saturday and Sunday. And then one of the things we're adding for Everglades this year is working on a secondary trolley within the park that takes you to the Nike Missile Site. So if any of you have never been to the history of the Nike Missile Site back during the Cold War, it's pretty neat to see they have some of the restored missiles and some of the, the areas there. So you can catch the trolley from downtown. It'll take you to Royal Palm where the Anhinga Trail is. And from there, you catch another trolley on Saturdays only to the Nike Missile Site for, a, for about a two or three hour tour and then come back. So that's something that's new this year that we're hoping you know, adds some, some new and excitement to, to a program that's been around now for a little while. And that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Um, I've got a couple of items. There is an, a request for an appointment to the Education Committee. Um, Ms. Fairclaw, you, you yes. requesting this? Uh, is, there a, is there a motion? Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. I want to also announce I have, an, I have it. We have one vacancy on the Community Relations Board, and we have three vacancies on the Historic Preservation Board. If you're interested in any of those uh, board positions, please contact the city clerk, contact my office, contact anybody's office. Just uh, come and participate. I want to also say just, to, just briefly to city staff, Chief, Barbara, Julio, Race weekend, another success. Uh, I know the I saw the guys and girls out there working tirelessly, sun up to sundown, and and I've heard nothing but uh, good things. So uh, again, Mr. Manager, to to the team. I know you have a lot of there's a lot of people working behind the scenes and nobody really sees, but uh, thanks to you and the staff that it was a Super Bowl event that we didn't mess up on again. So uh, very very good. PR for us. I don't know if you got a chance to see it on television, but it was like a picture, picture perfect weekend, Chamber of Commerce weather, and uh, just just a beautiful event. So, but I want to thank the staff, and please tell your staff members, you know, how greatly we appreciate their hard work because they, they, that's a heavy lift. That's two. That's the size of the city twice on one weekend. So, um, that's really all I have. Is there a motion to adjourn? All in favor. Motion carries. Good night, everyone. Thank you.